All right, we're all in our seats, awesome. For better or worse, you guys are stuck with me for, for the night. Uh, I promise not for too long. Uh, good evening and welcome to the 10th annual AFA Leadership Dinner. All right, I'm gonna need a lot of that out of you guys throughout the night and like, prep, like let's get, get it super loud. Um, my name is Khan and I am the Vice President of AFA. Uh, little do you know, I actually planted him in the crowd. Uh, many of you guys know me as the guy who has been haunting your email inboxes for the past two, three months uh, persistently to get you to come to this event. Uh, we are deeply grateful for your presence here tonight. Uh, I know we probably say this every single year, but this year, uh, we believe we've actually shattered the record for the number of attendees to come tonight. Can I get another applause? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just to be safe, I'm actually not going to tell you what that number is. Um, as you know, the dinner is the flagship event for our organization. This dinner allows us to mark Asian Pacific Heritage Month, but also represents a night of mentorship and networking. Um, of course, uh, tonight would not be a leadership dinner without the presence of our senior leaders, right? Um, so I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge their presence. Uh, I ask that each senior leader please stand when I call your name. And for everyone else, I know this is very exciting, but please hold your applause until the very end, okay? All right, I'm gonna kick this off. Uh, Jamila Akbari, Chief of the Strategic Workforce Planning Staff, soon to be the Director of the Office of Accessibility and Accommodations for the Bureau of Human Resources. That was a mouthful, right? I nailed that one, yeah, yeah. All right, Alexander Arvizu, former ambassador to Albania and last year's leadership liaison to AFA. Hi, sir. Richard Wangen, Executive Assistant to the Secretary of State. <laughs> Brian Bulatow, Senior Advisor to the Secretary of State and nominee for Under Secretary of State for Management. <laughs> Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs and current leadership liaison to AFA, one of our fearless leaders, Julie Chung. Michelle Gaida, Assistant Secretary and Senior Official for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. We are very fortunate to have her as the keynote speaker tonight. How am I doing with these titles? All right. Uh, Yuri Kim, Director of Southern European Affairs and former Director of the State Department Center for the Study of Conduct of the Conduct of Diplomacy. Amanda Milius, Interim Deputy Assistant Secretary for Content in the Bureau of Public Affairs. <laughs> One of our very own and AFA board member, Robert Ogburn, Director of the Office of Citizen Exchanges in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. <laughs> Traveling all the way from Haiti, Michelle Sisson, Ambassador to Haiti and former Ambassador to Sri Lanka, Lebanon and the UAE, as well as the deputy, former deputy perm rep to the UN. <laughs> Traveling all the way from Somalia, Donald Yamamoto, ambassador to Somalia and former ambassador to Ethiopia and Djibouti. And very close to me, heart, my heart because I worked for him before, Hoi Yi, Senior Fellow at the U.S. Institute for Peace and former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Europe and the Balkans. <laughs> Last but not least, Hugo Yan, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Transportation in the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. Okay, you guys broke my rules, so can we do a collective like applause? Yeah. All right, very good. 
Moving on. Um, OK, so uh, I will turn things over to AFA board member Bao Li, seated in the back right, uh, to talk about our internship program. Um, before I do so, I'd like to go over our list of May events. Uh, this dinner is only one of many events that the entire board has worked very hard to put together for Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And so I'd like to mark those. Um, at 6 p.m. on Thursday, May 16, we are hosting an interagency happy hour at DuPont Circle fe featuring Pulitzer Prize winner and author of The Sympathizer, Viet Thanh Nguyen. Who is us? Um, at 11, the very next day, Friday, May 17th, in the Burns Auditorium, we are hosting a keynote event with Viet, Not Viet Thanh Nguyen. So this is your second opportunity to interact with him. Uh, and finally, at noon on Thursday, May 30, we are hosting a film screening and discussion on the life of Norm Mineta in the Dean Atchison Auditorium. Uh, so with that, uh, Bao, can I ask you co to come up here and chat about our internship program? Hey, good evening. I'm very happy to be here because I get to talk about our internship stipend program. So if you were here with us last year, you'll recall that um, AFA's then treasurer, Joe Lin, who is right here, um, announced our new partnership with the American Foreign Service Association to provide financial assistance uh, to unpaid Department of State interns from historically underrepresented API groups. Um, and so this year, we're pleased to be back to announce that um, the AFA board and AFSA have selected our first recipient of the internship stipend, uh, internship stipend fund. Um, we received about 50 applications this year for our inaugural um, fund. Um, the internships, the interns came from across the nation and uh, we are announcing that we selected uh, Joa C. Sylvia Peng. She's an undergraduate in uh, international studies from Vassar College. And she will be receiving $1,300 financial assistance award from AFA and AFSA. So a round of applause. Um, Sylvia's story is probably familiar to a lot of us in this room. Um, she immigrated from Taiwan with her parents at the age of nine. Um, she struggled to learn English growing up and um, this created a lot of anxiety with her uh, as she was growing up, but it did not stop her from uh, succeeding in school and contributing to her community. Um, we were impressed by her work in the community. She has uh, worked to protect the rights of Chinese victims of domestic violence, and she has also worked to advocate for access to HIV education and prevention for uh, Franco-Chinese sex workers who are living in a precarious environment. Um, the AFA board is truly excited that Sylvia is going to be interning this summer in the Bureau of East uh, Asian and Pacific Affairs, and specifically with the China Desk. Um, Sylvia um, obviously could not be here today. She's still up in New York, but she uh, wanted to let you all know that she's really looking forward to the opportunity to work on foreign policy, and in her own words, to be a part of this new narrative of what it means to be American. Um, we intend to have a robust program of mentorship and engagement for Sylvia when she starts the summer with the Department of State, um, and we hope that all of you will be a part of it. I also want to take this moment to thank Joe Lin um, for his efforts and his continued leadership with the Stipend Fund and AFSA for their partnership, as well as the rest of the committee members who uh, read through every application and selected the, uh, the winner. Um, I'm just going to name them here. If you could just wave and we, so we can acknowledge you. Uh, Song Choi, Robert Ogburn, um, Heather Hualik, Tina Wong, uh, Tu Rajan, Cindy Nya Trin, and Alan Saunders from AFSA. So if I can get everyone's attention this evening. We're going to uh, continue with our formal program as they clear the plates and they start to bring out dessert and coffee and tea. And before, uh, my name is Matthew Asada. I'm currently serving as the president of the Asian American Foreign Affairs Association, 
We're delighted to have all of you here this evening. And I think the first uh, thing I'd like to do is recognize the efforts of our Vice President, Khan, who put together tonight's lovely evening. And as we all know, it takes a team to do any of the work at the State Department. And so I'd like to ask all of those AFA board members to also stand as well and be recognized at this time. If you're not AFA board member, please stand. And probably even more important than the people that are currently with us are the people that went before. And again, that paved the way for us to be here today. And we're so happy and honored to actually have two previous AFA presidents here in the room, Jules Kim and Sarah, Sarah Shabir. And the two AFA presidents would please stand up. And in absentia, I'd also want to recognize Tom Wong, a previous AFA president, who, although he could not be here this evening, graciously extended support so another one of our community could join us. And again, paying it forward to help others be here today. And that's actually one of the things I want to talk about is uh, about doing this in partnership, because none of us can do this alone. And this evening, we're also honored for the entire month of May, actually, as we celebrate Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, to be doing this in partnership with the South Asian American Employees Association, SEA. And tonight we have our representative here, Julie Sara Matthews, from that organization. And we have representatives from the other employee affinity groups here as well, Liz Lee from Glyfa, the president. And from the Office of Civil Rights, we have our liaison who supports all of the diversity and inclusion work here at the Department of State, Andrea Silliers. Again, we do this in partnership with one another because alone the work is impossible. The second thing I want to talk to you a little bit tonight is about building community. That's one of the reasons why we're here this evening, taking it outside of the office. Because again, as Asian Americans, we know that, again, it really takes a family. And I'm so honored to have here this evening um, a very close family friend. I introduced him to some of you as my uncle, Dr. Sonny Yamasaki, and his wife, Alice Yamasaki. Sorry, and his mother. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, and I said, uncle, although, you know, in our, you know, extended family context, he's not really my uncle. He's my dad's best friend. And that's something that I think for many of us, uh, the extended concept of family, of who we are, of, again, he's actually, uh, his mother just joined him down in Florida to live with him. The idea of extended multi-generation families. That's something, again, that many of us may have grown up with, and many of us uh, in the future may have our parents join us. And what is so important, I think, and I wanted to recognize uh, Mrs. Alice Yamasaki this evening, is that she, like my great-grandparents, uh, like my grandparents, actually spent time in the internment camps during World War II. And again, this is something that for the Japanese American community, you know, their generation, their parents' generation, didn't talk about it. It was not something that, you know, they were proud of because their loyalty as American citizens had been questioned strictly because of where their ancestors came from. Again, born in the United States, Japanese American citizens, and yet, they were, uh, along with 120,000 other people, went to those camps during World War II because of fear, because of prejudice. And those are some things that I think we all take with us as we uh, work to ensure that those type of things don't happen again. And so again, part of telling you 
about my family's story is to help to develop a connection and a bond. Because I think it's through our family stories that we learn a little bit more about each other and understand kind of where we come from. So again, building that community together. And the final thing I want to leave you with tonight is how do we take this community and move forward together at the State Department in the broader foreign affairs community? AFA has been working on three issues over the last uh, year or so, and I want to talk to you about uh, one of them here this evening. In short, throughout the month, you'll be hearing uh, from representatives talking about different things. You know, one of our priorities has been assignment restrictions. This has been something that Jules, Sara, Tom Wong, and others have worked very hard over the years to ensure that all of us have the opportunity to serve anywhere around the world, and that in the event that one of us receives an assignment restriction, that we understand why this is being applied, that there's transparency in that communication, and sometimes the department makes mistakes. And in that event, there's an opportunity for the employee to appeal that assignment restriction and perhaps open up some opportunities for that person to serve and to ensure that we have a diverse workforce moving forward. So assignment restrictions have been one of the top priorities here for the AFA. And in 2017, we were able to get legislation passed that established the employee's right to appeal the assignment restriction, which is a huge step forward, again, not for AFA alone, but again, for the entire department and on behalf of the American people. So that's one of the things that we've been really advocating for, and we're, we're not quite there yet. There's still a little bit of work to do, but we want to recognize all the great work that this administration has done uh, to bring us to where we are, and hopefully we can take one more step forward to make good on that employee right. The second thing that we've been working on is ensuring that everyone has opportunities to serve a fulfilling career here in the civil service, in the foreign service, in our contracting personnel. And that means that people have the opportunity to receive those assignments that are gonna be good for career development. And one of the things that we've asked the department is to take a closer look at how the assignment process works. Because the statistics are pretty good about how we enter the service. If you actually look at the A100 classes, the civil service coming on board, the percentage of Asian American Pacific Islanders is pretty good. It's pretty on par. However, at the senior levels, uh, you know, the department itself has recognized that there's a deficit, there's a gap. And how do you, again, close that gap over time? In our system, in our foreign service system, where you enter at the bottom and you work your way up, it's gonna take some years. However, perhaps there's some things that are happening in between that are preventing us from getting to the place where we can be more competitive for those positions at the deputy chief of mission level, at the principal officer level, at the D committee level going up for chief of missions. And we're so honored here to have, again, one of our four career ambassadors, Ambassador Sisson, join us and be recognized as one of the four uh, most senior ranking officers here in the State Department. And again, one of uh, the only female career ambassadors. So again, I'd just like to recognize her this evening. And as we work through that assignments process, we're just saying, maybe there's a way that we can do this differently. Maybe there's a way that we can build and take lessons from the private sector that has this idea of sponsorship. Again, sponsoring people when they're coming up. Again, it's not just mentoring, but again, it's identifying those folks a little bit further along and what we can do for them. The final priority, so assignment restrictions, the assignments process, is building the governance and communication of this body, of this organization. It's probably the least sexy of them all. Who wants to talk about governance? Who wants to talk about communications? Besides maybe our assistant secretary <laughs> for public diplomacy and public affairs. But again, these are some of the behind the scene things that we've been doing. Again, I want to call out you know, our board member, Cheko Umina, who helped to revitalize working with colleagues in the Bureau of ISN to have our new SharePoint site or our new logo or Khan and his work in getting our charter approved, again, with your support, that charter amendment process, that we were able to have SOCR recertify us for the next three years moving forward. 
not sexy stuff, but it's important. We're building institutions, we're building governance to ensure that in 10 more years, we can have AFA celebrating, hopefully, maybe even grown out of this room because of the size and number of attendees. So as we celebrate the month of May, I just wanted to, again, talk to you a little bit about some of those policy priorities, assignment restrictions, assignment process, and governance and communication that we've been working on. And we hope that you will join us on the leadership when we have elections a little bit later this summer. At this point, I'd like to invite our senior advisor, Julie Chung, up to the stage. Thanks, Matthew. What an exciting evening to be here. I feel the energy. I feel the food, the clinking of the glasses. I'm too short for this, I think. So I want to really thank everybody, uh, all the members of the board of AFA, but all the friends and family and supporters of AFA here in this room. You know, it's been a, a big year for Asian Americans. We had the first uh, woman, a person of Asian descent, host the Golden Globe Awards, Sandra Oh. She's actually Canadian, uh, Korean, <laughs> Canadian, Korean. Uh, we also had the great blockbuster, Crazy Rich Asians. And while some of us may be crazy in the State Department, we're definitely not rich because we work for the U.S. government. Um, but no less glamorous are many of our stars here at the State Department, of course. Brian Bulatow, Michelle Gaida, Ambassador Sisson, uh, Ari Arvizu and Yamamoto, and all our senior leaders here. Forget the Hollywood stars. We've got our superstar crowd, A Group, right here in our A-list. And as Matthew said, we need more. We need more Asian American leaderships, both political appointees, and also senior foreign service and, and civil service uh, career am ambassadors and senior officers just as well. And we've seen the examples in the private sector that shows that the productive and successful teams out there are built from diversity. And that is a, a proven case that we've seen from Google, from law firms, from all kinds of companies. And so this tonight is a night of celebration, it's a night of advocacy, it's a night of support. And that's what AFA does. And I'm so proud and humbled to be a part of that as your senior liaison. As some of you may know, I joined the Foreign Service as the first cohort of the Pickering Fellows. Now, how many Pickering Wrangell Fellows are out there? We've got quite a number. So as uh, part of the very first cohort, they sometimes call me the grandmother of all Pickerings. <laughs> uh, please don't call me Grams. <laughs> I think I'm too young for that. But because of what I achieved and I received and was mentored through that Pickering Fellowship, I really feel more than ever uh, a willingness and a drive and a motivation to really help that next generation. And that's a lot of people who need that help and that boost up. So coming from that um, angle and knowing that we have so many talents amongst us, how can we move that forward? So we know that AFA and other affinity groups have collaborated with department leadership and stakeholders on many issues, some of that Matthew has mentioned. They're revising the assignment preclusion regulations, accreditation of same-sex spouses, promoting awareness of affirmative hiring for people with disabilities. So in 2016, the Deputy Secretary for Management established a quarterly diversity forum where these discussions can be had. And Deputy Secretary Sullivan now leads those quarterly meetings with representatives from all the affinity groups, including AFA. And that is where we can advocate for positive change. AFA also engages with diversity councils of individual bureaus, such as the S Bureau's Seventh Floor Inclusion Council, which is comprised of employees working on the seventh floor dedicated to advancing inclusiveness, diversity, and equal opportunity. So my plea to everybody here is for you to be engaged, and that's every level, whether you're a first tour officer, whether you're from DOJ, whether you're a senior ambassador, what, at whatever level, the appeal is for everyone to be engaged in word and deed. And recently, Secretary Pompeo announced his ethos for the State Department. And there's a few lines from that that really resonated for me. It says, I am a champion of American diplomacy. I show an unstinting respect in word and deed 
from my colleagues and all who serve alongside me. When I think of that statement and this ethos, it's best reflected in the strength of our diversity. And that comes and starts right here with AFA and with all the other affinity groups. So I hope that you stand with us. And there's so many ways to be engaged through AFA and the other affinity groups. We encourage your engagement, your leadership, your mentorship, and being there to listen and help the next generation. So thank you. That's that ghost. <clears throat> I think they're gonna uh, serve, continue to serve dessert here and tea and coffee to folks, but at this point in the program, I'd like to uh, turn your attention. I hope that all of you picked up one of these lovely bio books uh, this evening. Uh, we're indebted to our fellow board members, uh, Kathy Duong, our intern, Rebecca Fish, and everyone that worked on these uh, to put it together. But uh, this actually includes all of the attendees at tonight's dinner. Um, again, we did our best to uh, get everyone uh, included. And you, when you registered for the dinner, you were asked to provide your bio, asked to provide a photo. We tried to follow up with you afterwards uh, if you did not do it the first time around. Um, <laughs> but again, any omissions are all our own. It's our own fault if we didn't have it in there, but we did our best job to give you a little bit of a keepsake uh, and to help in that professional development and networking. The other thing it allows us to do is to focus again on our speakers, such as uh, Julie Chung, as well as our keynote speaker this evening, Assistant Secretary Michelle Guida. So Michelle's, uh, Assistant Secretary Guida's bio is in the um, booklet, so I'm not going to read the entire thing. But I will say this is that uh, since her start in February of 2018 as our Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs and more recently in February of 2019 when she assumed responsibilities for the Under Secretary of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, she's been a real force for change. And we've seen that in what she has done with the two bureaus, Public Affairs and IIP one of the largest reforms ever in our public diplomacy history. And that's something that, for those of you non-PD officers out there, may not fully appreciate, but those are two huge organizations that, again, a legacy of USIA that she has been able to bring together and announce. So that's just one of her many accomplishments that she's had in this short time here in office. Um, and I know that she's looking forward to sharing a little bit more of her story with you this evening. So please welcome Assistant Secretary Gaida to the podium. It's that ghost again. All right. Can you hear me? Does that work? All right. Thank you very much, Matthew. Appreciate the introduction and good evening, everybody. It's exciting to be here. Let me move this out of the. Does that still work? Good. All right. Um, so thank you very much to AFA for having me tonight. I've been really looking forward to coming here and being a part of this dinner. And it's an honor to be here at your 10th annual leadership dinner and the legacy that you've created over the past decade. And as we heard from uh, Vice President Kang Nguyen, earlier this evening. Tonight's dinner is one of just several events that are going to be going on oh, over the course of the week um, as part of what AFA has organized for Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the audience and many new faces as well. I'm pleased that tonight offers us a chance to meet, as Matthew was saying, outside of the department uh, to grab a meal together outside of the building, although I love my Subway and my Dunkin' Donuts from the cafeteria every morning. It's a reminder, too, of the importance of good civilian military relations and how the departments of state and defense work together to advance American interests. And I want to recognize and thank those of you with current and prior military service here tonight. Thanks for your service. <laughs> 
It's also great that we have so many senior leaders joining us tonight, including past and present AFA mentors, both official and unofficial. Thanks to Pete Ass Chung uh, for your work with AFA as its senior leadership liaison and for providing our senior leaders with a call to action and engagement. I also want to recognize Ambassador Sisson, our U.S. Ambassador to Haiti, and one of four career ambassadors, as Matthew had said, um, serving in the Foreign Service. Thank you so much for your leadership and for representing us so well. We're also honored to have Ambassadors Yamamoto and Arvisu, as well as Senior Advisor Bulatau. And thanks again to Matthew Asada for your leadership of this organization. So as Matthew was saying, I wanted to share a little bit about my personal story. And, and more than my story, my family's story, because I think, to his point, uh, that really helps to share what America's story is all about. And then I want to talk a little bit about the power of all of us coming together and using our collective stories and our collective voices to advance American diplomacy. So I took my first ever oath of office 15 months ago, last February in 2018. And my family and I, my husband, Kellen Guida, is here. Uh, we moved down from New York to DC so that I could take on this job within the span of five days. And when they said that I could be sworn in anywhere I wanted to, I knew exactly where I wanted to take the oath. And that was at the Vietnam Wall. And that's because I see my journey and my family's journey as very much tied to that place and that wall and what it stands for. The first time I visited the wall was with my dad. It was in 2007. And I was moving to DC from Southern California to go to graduate school at George Washington. And it was our first time, both me and my dad, seeing all the monuments and visiting DC and, and witnessing all the memorials. And as many of you know, when you go and visit the wall, it's really powerful, right? Because it's made of black marble. And whether it's sunny outside or whether it's cloudy outside, you can see your reflection in it. And you can see your reflection between the names of the 58,000 men and women who died and gave their lives in that war. So it was really powerful for both of us. I know it was really powerful for my dad. He was a veteran. He served in Vietnam. He volunteered. He lost friends. And he was a Navy CB. He served in Da Nang in 1968. And if you know the CBs or if you've seen the John Wayne movie, um, they are the engineering and the construction arm of the US Navy. And their motto is can do. It's can do with an exclamation point. And that was certainly his motto and one that I've tried to carry forward in my life and especially my work here at the State Department. And I remember in that first visit to the wall, my dad and I were standing there. We looked at our reflections and I turned to him and I asked, did you ever think you'd be standing here next to your half Vietnamese daughter? And he sort of shrugged and we kind of laughed. And it was just one of those interesting moments where the story comes together. So my dad was a vet. My mother's from Vietnam. She and my grandmother left Saigon one week and one day before the collapse of Saigon in 1975. And it wasn't the first time that they had fled communism. After Vietnam was divided into the North and South, after the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, my grandmother decided she didn't want to live under communist rule. She and my, my family at the time were from the North. And she decided better to risk everything and take my mother and, and her other daughter, uh, my mother is only a couple months old, take them and move south, risk everything, leave behind their families. She left my grandmother or my grandfather for a little bit um, and went and took the family south because she decided she would not and could not live under communist rule. And about 10 years later, after her husband, my grandfather had passed away, he eventually moved south with her. Um, she was a single mother with four children, and she had to find a way to take care of our family. So she learned English, and she found a job working at the US Agency for International Development in Saigon, which we all know is USAID. She always called it USAID. <laughs> VOA is VOA, VOA Ting Viet. But she worked there for many years with her Vietnamese and American colleagues. And it was because of that job with USAID, that she was able to leave the country on April 29th, 1975, one day before the collapse of Saigon, on an American airplane. And I think of that every single morning that I walk into the State Department. 
My mother was only 21 at the time, but she was too old to accompany my grandmother as a, um, a minor outside of the country. So she found her own way out of the country with an American friend of the family. And she left everything too. She didn't know if she was going to see my grandmother again. She packed like five dresses because she found out in a matter of hours that she was going to be able to leave the country. But she left her family, she left her job, she left her home. And they didn't know if they would end up together, if they'd ever see each other again, but they knew they had to get out because they wanted to be free. And by God's good graces, they reunited again a few days later in a refugee camp in Guam. They were sponsored by an American family, they became American citizens, and they began a new and very beautiful life in the United States. My mother cleaned boats, she worked in fast food, she babysat, and then eventually found her way to a 30-year career at a biomedical company in Southern California. Our country is amazing. And for my family, America truly was that shining city on a hill. It was the place that my grandmother and my mother could go to find freedom, to find a new life, to find joy, and to find peace. And hearing those stories from my father and my grandmother and my mother, as Matthew said, I grew up in an extended family. My grandmother lived with us and helped take care of me and my sister. But hearing all of these stories of what war was like, what living under communism was like, what fleeing your country is like, uh, made it very clear that the freedom that we enjoy in the United States is a beautiful, beautiful gift and that we have to cherish it and we have to do everything we can to protect it. So it's my ultimate privilege and my ultimate honor to serve the United States at the State Department every day. And one of the most cherished moments of my life was being able to take the oath and be sworn in at the Vietnam Wall with my mother there last year. And now in my role in public affairs and in public diplomacy, I have this great honor and great opportunity to wake up every single day thinking about how we communicate on behalf of the United States to the rest of the world. But it's not only my job. This is what I want to talk about a little bit today. It's the responsibility of everybody in this room. Whether or not you're in public affairs or public diplomacy, political econ management, consular, foreign service or civil service, we all have a role in using our unique voices to communicate and advance American diplomacy. So here are the two big opportunities that I see for each of us to be leaders, no matter our level, no matter what we do. First is to use your unique voice, your unique story to tell America's story and to advance our cause together. We're here tonight to celebrate the richness of our culture, of our diversity, the personal journeys that got us here, the personal journeys of our families, but that ultimately ended up in all of us choosing a career of service. You know, Secretary Pompeo over the weekend, he spoke at the Claremont Institute and he talked about love of one's country. He said, what's good for the United States, a foreign policy animated by love of our unique way of life is good for the world. So I encourage you to get out there and tell your story and share your love of our country. It's one of the most important messages we have, and each one of you in this room is one of the most important messengers that we have. Second, we have to take that and empower individuals and their voices all around the world as well. In the United States, we recognize the voice of the individual as core to the cause of our freedom. Our First Amendment affirms it, the freedom of speech, freedom of press, but we know that it's not true in many countries that we're in and that we've served in and that we engage with on any given day. And as the communications landscape and the media landscape is being disrupted by technology, we have tremendous challenges, but we have this opportunity like never before in history to think about how we can empower people and users and individuals across the world to have a stronger voice and a bigger platform than ever before. Whether it's through the work that we do in public diplomacy, training journalists, uh, media trainings, working with foreign governments on press freedom, the tech camps that we do to connect the private sector with social media entrepreneurs so that they can learn how to best use media, fighting disinformation and propaganda, or platforms like VOA and the BBG, which is now USAGM, in telling the truth and finding untold stories and advancing American values. So my hope and my ask is that you'll engage in that important work and really embrace your role as being some of the most important and strongest communicators on behalf of the United States of America. So I'll conclude with this. 
Uh, as you can tell, I've got a new son on the way any minute now. Uh, but for him and for all of our children, I believe it's my job, I believe it's the job of all of us in this room to ensure our country remains the freest, most prosperous nation on earth. And that it's up to us to bring our stories, our unique voices, and our ideas to bear to make sure it stays that way. So it's been my honor to be with you tonight, to be a part of this shared journey that all of us are on to celebrate our country and our service to our country. Thank you, Afa, for your great work, for the work uh, that you do every day at the State Department. And I look forward to working together with you to help carry our American story forward for future generations. Thank you. Almost forgot the imp most important items. Uh, sadly, I do have to signal the end of the formal program. Uh, but before I do so, I will not let Julie and Assistant Secretary Guida go just yet. Um, as a token of our appreciation, we know how much time, energy, and, a fo and focus it takes to um, dedicate to these sorts of issues on diversity, on cultivating a more diver diverse workforce in the State Department. We're deeply, deeply grateful and appreciative. And as a token of our appreciation, we have cards and gifts. Can I ask a both of you to please step up? Yeah. The cards are signed by the entire board. Here you are. And Matthew would, will present a couple of gifts. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. Um, that is the end of the formal program. However, feel free to stay and mingle. Uh, I look forward to meeting more of you out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.